Welcome back. You're watching Political Exchange. And of course, my guest tonight, Pumzile Mlambamuga, the new head of UN Women, also Under General Secretary of the United Nations. Pumzile, before the break, we spoke about leveraging partnerships, particularly we were looking at the example of Egypt. Um, I want to talk about particularly your relationship with Africa. There is an expectation, mm. because you are African and because you hail from the continent, that Africa... Because Africa deserves it. Yes, is not going to be the stepchild mm. again that we are mm. going to take center stage mm. as a continent. Um, and not just because we deserve it, but also because our problems mm. and our achievements mm. Mm. are very much mm. the focus. No. I mean, the continent is experiencing exponential growth. Mm. But of course, we can't close our eyes to the fact that we're still not doing well mm. on, uh, you know, mortality. We're yes. still not doing well yes. on very yes. basic things yeah. such as health. What are you going to be doing with this position to elevate uh, the position of African women perhaps not over that of others, mm. but certainly deserving of a priority. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm saying also a, a priority advisedly, because it's not at the expense a, of, the, of the other countries. The importance of focusing in Africa at this point in time is because of the need. Mm. I think South Africa, Southeast Asia, that is where you've got really large numbers of women who have a really hard life and therefore you couldn't drive a program on women without focusing on those hot, hot spots mm -hmm. um, uh, in the world. For one, I think I've already uh, received a very uh, encouraging correspondence from the chairperson of the, of the AU who has pledged support and a desire for an enhanced collaboration, right. which was also a, something that uh, was highlighted also in the meeting with, with, with the president. So I, as I look at the priorities of this unit, all of them apply to African women. Yes. You know, uh, it's economic empowerment that speaks to the economies of Africa and how they do or don't impact on women. When a country has a, a positive, GDP growth, it does not automatically translate to a better life for right. women, which is why uh, when you talk about growth, it must be shared growth. Mm -hmm. So an inclusive growth. An inclusive growth. And one of the priorities of this unit also is engendered budgets and planning. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be seeking uh, ways to sort of coordinate with the partners, with the countries in such a way that we, co we, we collaborate, we coordinate the growth that is happening, the budget that are, are, are happening and, and, and the spending that happens in countries so that uh, there is no disjuncture between right. economic growth and the manner in which uh, the, the, the budgets are actually being spent in the countries. I hope I can lean on a, a significant person like uh, the, the head of the IMF being a woman herself yes. who feels very strongly about these things because clearly the IMF is one of the institutions that can play a significant role in influencing the manner in which the countries spend their money. Mm -hmm. If one looks at continents like Africa, Asia, you find young people being that critical variable, mm. that mm. critical social force. Mm. And of course, young women, Africa is a continent of young mm. people. Mm. Um, what are the special measures that you um, that are in the existing plans mm. of UN Women, but mm. also from your own experience, uh, given your background uh, in education, um, that are targeting young women specifically in terms of keeping them in institutions of mm. learning, keeping them in institutions where they are skilled, mm. um, things like uh, you know agro-business, farming, mm. which mm. are very big activities occupied by women mm. in, in places mm. like Africa, mm. for mm. example. Well, uh, the way the, the strategic plan is, is now, in the manner in which it addresses the MDGs, it brings in these issues. But I guess what I'm saying is that uh, I would like us to emphasize those aspects more. In relation to young women, reproductive health, for right. instance, it's very important because probably it's one of the biggest barriers to women's progress. Once a woman has an unwanted pregnancy, the, the cycle of poverty starts and intergenerational poverty mm -hmm. is also a given. Uh, so this is important. Access to reproductive health intervention timelessly and systematically is is critical and of course education uh, I am looking at those two so that I don't try to do too much those two which uh, there's a general consensus in the world that these are critical interventions for women as amongst those two that I want to target to young women but also young women are workers mm -hmm. they are professionals uh, this is where one wants to leverage on older women as well to provide mentorship 
support lift as you climb mentality in order to bring up the young women i need to work with leaders in different countries on their program for giving a, a young women a push so that they are able to take their rightful place in society. Now we know there are many impediments, both structural related to the mm. economy, education, that hold women back. Mm. But what often also hold women back is the way in which patriarchal societies interpret culture, mm. religion, um, which are generalized as values mm. of all peoples. Mm. Mm. How are you going to be able to, on the one hand, allow people to be themselves mm, culturally, mm, be diverse, mm, mm. without it becoming a stumbling block for advancement and without it becoming a, a way or a set of codes that men often use to hold women back. Well, this is where mm. maybe sometimes one uh, would have to be brave and even controversial because uh, when it comes into cultural practices that oppress women, that interfere with women's progress, Usually there isn't, the area is not too grey. Right. You have to be brave enough to say not all, we, might, we cannot romanticize our cultures. Not all our cultures uh, are positive for the things that we want to achieve in the 21st century. And therefore, at some point, we need to be able to stand up and to criticize those aspects of our culture, practices and traditions that are not good for us. But obviously, I have to have a buy-in of the people in those yes. countries so that you don't come across as condescending and trying to tell people what to do with their countries. But at the same time, I must also have a right to have an opinion. Right. In, in terms of the kind of current challenges as one have identified it, I mean, we spoke about the structural issues. But if you look at the kind of growing inequalities in the mm. world, particularly mm. at an economic level, mm. and you look at the global crisis mm. and institutions like the UN, what is it that ought to be done differently in terms of empowerment? I mean, we know structural adjustment mm. programs have not worked. Your classic Brenton Woods mm. uh, institutional mm. mechanisms mm. have not worked. Mm. We've got BRICS uh, mm. that have come up many argue as a counterweight mm. to you know, the mm. UN, mm. for example. How are you going to leverage um, your position in the UN with other institutions like BRICS, like your yeah. AUs, um, but also just the idea that we need to be thinking out of the box, yeah. that the current ways in which we're doing things is simply not working. You know, I think we need a, a combination of bottom-up empowerment of women, positive uh, uh, bottom top down and sideways which is the collaboration across with other institutions i would i see that uh, in the context of the economies for mm -hmm. instance one needs to work with the emerging institutions such as BRICS, but also in the context of the UN. If you think of, 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 of institutions like ITU, right. which are, are forging ahead with addressing the new economy, and then you've got uh, ITU or ONTAD, I think sometimes we don't associate those institutions. They are very muscular right. in the way in which they, they, they hit us. We don't associ associate them with the empowerment of women in addressing gender equity. And I would like to venture into those terrain and see how one collaborates with those institutions. They can provide uh, t technology transfer, skills transfer, something that they do very well. And in any case, in their mandate as well mm -hmm. is fight against poverty and you cannot fight poverty without addressing the situation of women. Mm -hmm. Now I mean currently we have big institutions or big formations like your G20s coming mm. together where very critical issues around global trade are being discussed mm. um, and because you've spoken very clearly about wanting to tap into that private mm. sector mm. I mean the, this is obviously a uh, sets of uh, rules that governs international mm. trade what needs to change there, Pumzile? Because many people in the developing world believe that until the rules of the game mm. in terms of international trade mm. is changed, um, what we're doing through institutions like the UN in many ways end up like you know a band-aid over cancer. Mm. I mean, are you going to be interfacing with institutions like that to talk about things like budgets, yes. to talk about access for women farmers well, in the developing I'm world? So. I, I think that uh, I don't know enough uh, right now about uh, some of the dynamics of who represents who in terms of the protocol of the of, of the UN but I whichever way it works out the voice of women and the needs of women need to be brought to the high table mm -hmm. uh, the, the the women can be relegated to the sideshow we need to find a way something that I would also take counsel from my leadership in the UN from my, my colleagues, how do we put this in the center stage mm -hmm. of the debates that are happening within the UN 
and within some of the multilateral and international institutions that uh, shape and design the world the way our world works. Mm -hmm. Now, you, when this appointment came, you know, it um, took many people by surprise. Some thought that it kind, of, <laughs> it, kind, it kind of came about, um, you know, miraculously. Yeah. But you have interacted mm. on the global stage. Mm. Um, even prior to becoming a, a minister in mm. the South African mm. government, you've mm. always worked in fields like education, women, mm. um, and you've had a long track record with international mm. organizations. Mm. Is this for you a culmination of your of the many years that you've put in, in terms of, you know, the empowerment of women, is this something that you see as a logical step for you to be doing? To, to some extent, I think that uh, I was lucky as a teenager, the first women's organization I joined was an international organization. So my orientation into it was that there are more than 50 countries that are members, members of, it was the YWCA, believe yes. it or not. And, uh, and that just from day one just opened my eyes about the similarity of the problems that women face around the world. Of course, it was pre-internet, so you couldn't uh, be as exposed as you can. Right. But that gave you an opportunity to travel at a relatively young age. But in addition, I was appointed the first global coordinator for young women uh, in the YWCA in order to celebrate International Youth Year. Mm -hmm. That meant that I was working with women. I traveled the whole of Africa, I traveled Asia, I traveled the Pacific, I traveled Europe, Middle East, wherever there were hot spots uh, around issues that had to do with human rights, I was there. But in addition, because there was an anti-apartheid struggle to right. fight and there was the UDF, which I was part of, I used that opportunity also to go around the world doing my bit for anti-apartheid and finding people that could support our struggle. And I think more than anything else, that is what has prepared me for this job. And of course, government, you know, has been, a, in, in, and the ANC, a, which shaped me, mm -hmm. you know, has been an important party to this. Final question, Pumzile. Everybody wants to know whether this is the kind of long walk back to mm. formal politics. Are you going to be, you know, once your stint is over at the UN, rejoining active politics in South Africa? Are you going to be coming back to the African National Congress? Are you going to be coming back to COPE? What are your, you know, political plans in terms of South Africa? Are you going to be the candidate that, you know, everyone is talking about that South Africa is going to field in, in, in you know, 2017 about you know, coming to the party as the first uh, woman's president. What are, what are your plans no, I, beyond this? I haven't planned that, that far. <laughs> but, you know, just serving the women of the world, that's a huge uh, task. If I am able to make a difference there and uh, to, to impact there, I think that, for me, would be a, an amazing uh, a contribution. Whether after that I would still be wanting to do something more back in South Africa or globally, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it.